they want a class war. They need a class war to stay relevant. Um, but the truth of the matter is nobody else really wants it. No, nobody wants it, and probably not even the train drivers who are earning up to £100,000 a year uh, for a job which is only four days a week. Mm. Uh, this is a grotesquely disproportionate abuse of trade union power, and I think it brings the union movement into disrepute. Yeah. And indeed, I think it brings the Labour Party into disrepute for supporting it, even if they overtly pretend that they are simply sitting on the sidelines. A large number of senior Labour MPs are out there on the picket lines with the strikers. Absolutely right. I mean, the fact that Keir Starmer can't make up his mind is nothing new. Um, but I've seen, certainly seen individual Labour MPs who claim to be trade unionists uh, saying that, uh, that this is a great thing um, and that the Tory government have got it all wrong. Well, I mean, that shows you that this is not an industrial strike over uh, pay and conditions. It's a political declaration of war mm. on a democratically elected government. Whether you like this government or not, it isn't up to the trade union movement to use what is, as I say, a disproportionate uh, use of their power, which is enormous, to bring the nation and the economy to a grinding halt to the cost of a million billion pounds a week. Um, this is going to damage the economy, not just now, but possibly uh, for a very long time, because there are many more of these strikes planned and no sign whatsoever of a deal being reached. No. Well, they don't seem to want to reach a deal. I mean, there's nothing on the table from the RMT uh, which would suggest that they are willing to compromise about anything. But, of course, they always no. do in the end, and normally, and this is how we got here, I think, because normally what happens is they don't accept modernisation, they just accept more money, and that'll probably be, in the end, what happens. Well, it, it, they, they, that's because they've been allowed to get, to get away with it yeah. for so many years. I mean, the sort of Spanish practices that... Uh, are enjoyed by the workers who are on almost double the average national income, mm. uh, I, a national wage at any rate, um, are, are the sort of things that died out in the 1970s and 80s uh, in every other sector of the workforce. And uh, those anomalies are still halting the efficiency of the railways to the point where the government, and in, in, in other words, the taxpayer, you and me and everybody else, had to fork out £16 billion to keep them afloat during the pandemic. And people aren't coming back to the railways and may, no. if this carries on, never come back to the railways in the same sort of uh, force that they did in the past. Well, there's no doubt that ever since, you know, that all the restrictions on travel were lifted and all the COVID restrictions disappeared, you know, the railways have been working very haphazardly ever since because people tell me all the time that you know they go to catch a train it's been cancelled uh, they have to get in the next train which is then full of people and people standing room only you can make a, a seat reservation and then you can't get a seat uh, it's terribly expensive um, it's unreliable um, and frankly speaking if you if you're traveling with any more than one person um, it's a much cheaper ride if you go in a car exactly and i think that the, the what we're seeing here is the whole workforce of the country being held to ransom by a comparatively small number of workers who happen to hold the levers of power in a way which should never have been tolerated. Uh, some sort of action should have been taken to make sure that essential services like this are protected from strike action. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount of power in the hands of some unaccountable people mm. who, as you rightly say, are more prone to nodding to the east towards Russia and communism and Marxism than they are towards de Western democracy. Yes. Well, I was listening to, uh, to Chris Loder this morning, MP, former member of the RMT, former uh, train guard himself, now Tory MP uh, down in the West Country. Um, he was saying that there are pictures of some of these uh, RMT leaders um, with a sort of Russian paramilitary group in Ukraine from 2015. Yes, I, I think that's quite overt. And... Uh, the idea that this is an impromptu strike that's just come to the boiling point uh, because of intransigent managers uh, is ab absurd. This has been bubbling away, and anyone who's been watching this scene closely over the last two years can, could have seen that the public sector was uh, spoiling for a fight. Mm. It was determined to take this government on, not because of pay and conditions, as they claim, simply because they disagree with the politics of this uh, government, which they describe as... Tory butchers. Yeah. That sort of inflammatory speech tells you a great deal about the motivation of those on strike.
No, exactly right. And isn't it interesting that Dave Ward is now congratulating them for representing their um, their workers so well uh, and exposing everything that's wrong with this country? So presumably the communication workers are going to be out soon. The teachers are saying they're going to strike. We've got the NHS workers saying they're going to strike. You know, it's all public sector unions that are now uh, sort of threatening a national strike effectively. Yes, it's the last thrashings, or at least I hope it's the last thrashings of the... Uh, dinosaurs of the old trade union movement of the 1960s and 70s. And it is up to this government to stand up to this sort of bullying and uh, militant uh, action, which is costing the country a billion pounds mm. a week. And in fact, if it carries on, as they're threatening to right up until Christmas, will cripple the economy, which is already struggling under the uh, hi highest levels of inflation we've seen for 20, mm. 30 or 40 years. Absolutely right. So what can Boris Johnson actually do? I mean, when you say stand up to them, what does that actually mean? Well, I think that he has to uh, make sure that the, 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 the people, the laws are in place so that the uh, trade unions simply cannot uh, declare uh, a strike action like this. I think that certain essential services should never be allowed to be brought to a standstill. This is throwing the entire country into chaos and people who have to work the many many millions who actually have to turn up at their workplace in order to earn a living are not able to do so these are the workers that the uh, rmt is claiming that it represents but those who are actually struggling into work by whatever means possible are taking hours to get there mm. they have to arrive in order to earn the money that they uh, need for their families that is not uh, a solidarity that is not uh, good industrial relations and frankly I think that the uh, the RMT leadership should be ashamed of themselves yes absolutely right and some of the things that they're sort of protecting these Spanish practices I mean, it takes me back as I'm sure you'll you'll never have forgotten Trevor the bad old days of the of the unions in Fleet Street I remember doing my first subbing shift at the mail on Sunday way back in about 1982 and they handed me a, um, a, a style guide and said can you get that photocopy so I went into the the room where the photocopier was there was a guy sitting there with his feet on the desk and I started to make a move towards the photocopy machine and he went stop right there I said why he said because you're not you're not touching that machine I said well all right I need this photocopy and he said you put it down there and I said well can you do it now he's like don't tell me what to do or this will be a strike I had to wait for him to decide when he wanted to photocopy it, when he was then going to deign to bring it back to me, and when I could actually then start working. I, I remember it vividly. <laughs> uh, my, uh, I mean, I was an industrial correspondent at the time, which sure. basically a strikes correspondent, uh, a, a strikes reporter. And uh, before that, I was what was called a stone sub, which was back in the Stone Age yeah. of old metal. And in those days, you had to work on the stone, the flat a bed where the paper was put together in, in lead. Were you to touch that lead, even just with your fingertips in passing to show what you wanted to, done on the change in the paper, they would call a strike. Yeah. They would stop work simply because you were doing something that crossed a boundary. There were these sort of Spanish practices and liners who could not cross. Right. That is now extinct in almost every form of uh, industrial practice outside the public sector. Yeah. It is only in the public sector that these antique, ancient and outdated um, Spanish practices are still allowed. It really is quite extraordinary. Do you think any of the, the rail companies themselves, though, should shoulder some blame for badly managing this whole situation? I think they probably can and do. And uh, But it is a fact, I think, that um, they are prepared to negotiate a, a fairly reasonable pay rise of mm. up to about 5%, as I understand it, yeah. if indeed the unions agree to certain measures which enable them to carry on as if they are living in the 21st century instead of the 19th or 20th. Mm. And they, these are areas where, as I say, in, in, back in the days of the printers, they took command of the process of production. This is what's happening in the uh, public sector unions and the railways. It is not the managers who manage, it is the, it is the workforce who tell managers what to do and how to do it. Yeah, it is absolutely extraordinary.